So hello everybody and uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Cybersecurity uh, and the FBI, an expert panel discussion with uh, Albany uh, FBI. My name is Will Trevor. I'm the uh, Assistant Dean and uh, Director of Online Programs here at uh, Albany Law School. This uh, particular web webinar is being hosted in conjunction with Global Cybersecurity Solutions. Next slide, please. Just a quick piece of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we have enabled closed captioning for you. If you look at the, the bottom of your, your screen, uh, you'll see where it says live transcript. You can turn the subtitles on. You can even change the, uh, the size of them as well. Now, we are recording, uh, as you will see. And so that recording will be made available to you afterwards. Uh, we will send it out to uh, attendees uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the, in the Q&A. Uh, and you'll also see in the, the chat, my colleague Nicole periodically will be posting a, a link to a survey. If you can give us your feedback, that helps us to continue to bring you great speakers like the ones that we have uh, on to today. The, the survey will also trigger at the end when, uh, when you go. So please do give us the feedback. Next slide, please. So the co-hosts of uh, this uh, event are Global Cybersecurity Solutions. Um, both uh, Jackie Gorelschik and uh, Kaylee Sporko are alumni of the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy uh, Program here at uh, Albany Law School. And uh, Rick Cabello, who is the, the president, is uh, actually a member of faculty here. So uh, if you want to find out, uh, about how they can help you in terms of your cybersecurity and data privacy needs. Um, the contact details are on the screen now. And uh, before we uh, uh, proceed further, uh, I'm just going to ask uh, um, uh, Dean Anthony Haynes uh, in a short video just to introduce Albany Law School's cybersecurity and data privacy program. Hi. I am Dean Anthony Haynes, and I created the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Program at Albany Law School to help professionals like you advance their career. Law.com reports that data privacy and cybersecurity officers are in high demand with little competition. And IAPP reports that 42% of all cybersecurity and privacy professionals hold a professional degree. Click below to learn more. And we look forward to speaking with you about how Albany Law School will help you advance your career to the next level. So if you'd like to find out more about that program, uh, please click the link that Nicole has put into the chat. Uh, there's also a, a link for you to be able to um, book an appointment with one of us to talk about them. Now, the next uh, application deadline uh, for the summer two term is uh, August the, the, the 16th for start of uh, Monday, the 20, uh, Monday, August the 23rd. We have six starts uh, a year. So if you want to find out more, give us a call on 518-443-5260 or email us at graduateadmissions at albanylaw.edu. Next slide, please. So it is my great pleasure to introduce your moderator today, Deb Snyder. Now, Deb is a C-level executive influencer educator who's dedicated her career to improving government services for the citizens of New York State through policy and technology innovation. She recently retired from a position as a CISO for New York State, where she led the state's cybersecurity programs and directed the, uh, the New York State Cyber Command Center. She's nationally recognized expert, speaker, and author who has presented at countless industry events. Her future leaning and compelling perspectives on leadership, organizational change, and cybersecurity make her a highly regarded advisor and sought after keynote speaker. She's a CEO founder of Iron Forged Associates, a senior fellow with the Center for Digital Government, and an adjunct professor. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Deb Snyder. Thank you for that great introduction, Will. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cybersecurity and the FBI, an expert panel discussion with Albany FBI. I'm really excited to be here with you for today's event. Thanks for joining us. I know we're going to have a great session over the next hour. First, let me introduce our panel. Joining me today are Philip Hale, Assistant Special Agent in Charge, 
Let me tell you a little bit about Philip. He started his FBI career in 2004 in the Chicago office where he worked violent gang matters for six years. In 2011, he was promoted to FBI headquarters where he served as supervisory special agent in the Directorate of Intelligence. And in 2013, he was selected as the field supervisor in Milwaukee and led the Human Intelligence Program and then the Joint Terrorism Task Force, including the International and Domestic Terrorist Programs and Evidence Response Team. In 2018, he was was selected as the assistant special agent in charge for Albany's national security branch, overseeing cyber, counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and the intelligence programs. Philip received his Bachelor of Science in Biology from Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois, a Juris Doctorate from the University of Missouri in Kansas City, and a Master's in Business Administration from Northwestern University Kellogg School of Management. Prior to joining the FBI, he worked as an attorney in Missouri and a business consultant in Mexico. Welcome, Philip. Thank you. Also here with us is Samantha Balserzen, Supervisory Special Agent, Cyber Task Force. Samantha has served in the FBI for over 17 years. She was a certified FBI forensics examiner for seven years and conducted incident response and digital forensics investigations in New York, Washington, and the Portland field offices. She's investigated cyber intrusion cases for the past eight years, including business email compromises, Ryuk ransomware, and national security cases. Samantha transferred to the Albany field office just over a year ago and became supervisor of the cyber squad this past summer. She holds multiple GIAC certifications in incident response, digital forensics, and the 20 critical controls and reverse engineering of malware. Welcome, Samantha. Thank you for having me. Our final guest is Roderick Link, computer scientist with the Cyber Task Force. Roderick has over seven years of experience as FBI's Albany computer scientist. In that time, he served as the division's primary subject matter expert on digital forensics, crypto analysis, network memory and malware analysis in support of over 500 FBI operations, including more than 40 computer intrusions. He's also a member of the FBI's cyber action team that's responsible for providing rapid incident response to the most critical attacks under FBI investigation. His recent deployments include combating the 2020 sunburst backdoor at US federal agencies and tracking and containing attackers who are accessing Super Bowl 2020 infrastructure. Roderick also spent eight years as an explosive ordnance disposal technician in the US military. Thank you for your service, Roderick, by the way, where he was rendered, where he rendered safe over 120 improvised explosive devices and thousands of unexploded ordnance in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. His industry certifications are many, including GREM, GPEM, GCIA, GCIH, GCFA, GASF, GMOB, GNFA, and Security Plus. Well, he's not, when he's not at his desk, you can find him out on the sidewalks near UAlbany and Quantico, and he's heckling students to finish their digital forensics homework usually. So welcome, Roderick, and thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks for having us, Deb. Thanks for having us. We're planning on covering a number of topics today, including uh, trends and unique challenges in cybersecurity from the FBI's perspective, what the FBI does, why it's important given cyber threats and cyber incidents that we're seeing today, the FBI's role in coordination with other partners and also opportunities within the FBI related to cyber. But before we get started, we'd just like to take a quick pulse check and get a sense of your perspectives. So we're gonna start out with two quick audience polling questions. So go ahead and pop your answers in for those. The first being, what is your current relationship to cybersecurity and privacy? One choice. And the second being, what do you see as the FBI's primary role in cyber incidents? I'll give you a couple of seconds to respond. And no, the hosts and panelists cannot vote. <laughs> no giving away the answer, especially to number full question number two. And Will, I was so glad that, that Anthony would, could uh, join us today with regard to just kind of briefly describing the program. I've been fortunate enough to meet and, and work with him in the past, and it was a, a real pleasure. Okay, let's take a look at what our poll results say. 
So they're still coming in, I would imagine, but it looks like uh, most of our attendees are drawing from academic, the security practitioners or CISO fields, and also the attorney field, which is as expected. In terms of polling question number two, either catching or disrupting the cyber actor, the bad guys, uh, seems to be in the lead at this point, which would certainly uh, provide important context for our panelists. So without further ado, let's do this. Let's jump right into our panel discussion. So to set the record straight and perhaps to dispel some of the mystery and myths that are out there, quite frankly, let's start with some background. The FBI has several roles and functions in terms of their play in cybersecurity and privacy, and each of you lead from very different areas. Can you provide some insights on the role and function in each of these areas? Philip, if you could please go first and then we'll hear from Samantha and Roderick. Well, thank you. It's a great question. I think uh, as part of the executive leadership team in the Albany field office, uh, what I do on the national security side and specifically with the cyber task force is I try to look maybe a year or two down the road, a couple of steps down the road and do strategic planning uh, to make sure that we have the proper resources, whether they be financial, whether they be uh, the tools that we need to, uh, to do our job or the right people in the right roles. And I just try to make sure that we're prepared to answer and respond to those trends uh, that are occurring in the cybersecurity field uh, for maybe a couple of years down the road and uh, just make sure that we're, we're prepared for that. And as the cyber supervisor, a lot of my job is working out in the field, establishing relationships with lots of different entities. Uh, my favorite part is building relationship with liaison points of contact because this is a wonderful opportunity for everybody to work together against the bad guys. A lot of our best information comes from our partners on a regular basis um, and having those relationships set up in advance um, is extremely beneficial. I also try and make sure that the folks that work with me um, on the squad have all the resources that they need to do their job on a regular basis in terms of software, equipment, um, and everything else. And then in terms of incident response, um, I can be present to make sure that we're doing interaction um, at the management level um, to make sure that everybody's questions are answered. Although my folks are completely uh, able to do that on their own as well. So every case that we work here at the FBI has a special agent that leads that case and has to make a lot of decisions about the direction of that case. And many of the cases also have a victim that's in a position where the victim has to make a lot of uh, high value decisions. So we wanna enable each of the victims and each of the agents to make well-informed decisions. So we have a variety of technical experts. Um, I provide technical expertise on computer network exploitation so the victims can understand what the adversary is doing in the network. So the agent can understand what are the best collection points for effective digital evidence. And I provide expertise on uh, digital forensics so that we know how to properly collect, preserve, and exploit that evidence once we collect it. Thank you for covering all of those different areas. Um, as I've experienced firsthand, cyber is an all hands on deck team sport. And unfortunately, not everyone involved has the same agenda or incentives to cooperate, collaborate, share intelligence, tools, techniques, and so on. You have private contractors, your cyber insurance companies, unique government agencies with various interests, law enforcement agencies like the New York State Police or local law enforcement, and also federal agencies like the Department of Homeland Security and the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, DHS and CISA. So where does the FBI fit in in terms of this soup of cyber players? What's your role in coordinating all these partners or among the partners, if you will? Can you talk about maybe some of the challenges that that presents, the roles you might play when an organization calls you in, and maybe even if possible, give us some good examples of how it all sorts out in the field? Well, I think uh, from an executive level, I'll start there and, uh, and tell you that uh, the way that we view the cyber threat and the way that it's evolving is first and foremost, we have the ticket, I would say, if we're gonna try to attribute and go after and catch the bad guy figure out who did it and go bring them to justice, make them pay for what they're doing and try to stop them from doing it in the future. Uh, but we also will collaborate and join in the, the response to an incident. And we also have a role uh, with our other partners in prevention. 
Uh, and so when we take a look at all those different functions that we are involved in at the FBI, we view this as um, it's a threat that's bigger than any one agency. We can't do it by ourselves. We don't think that really anybody else can. So we, we just try to encourage everyone to collaborate and join together to try and eliminate any redundancies. Our, our adversary is very uh, quick moving and adapting and they always seem a little bit ahead of the game. And so we need to be as efficient and as effective as we possibly can. Joining together and working together, I think is the best way for us to do that. So we're always reaching out to our partners and trying to find ways to efficiently work together with them. And I think with that, maybe hand that off to Samantha and Roderick and talk about things on the ground. Sure, so one of uh, the functions that we can serve in building those forward relationships is you always know who to call when we're uh, in order to make that contact and integrate us into the process early on. But there's no harm in bringing us in early. Um, and if it reaches a point where you need to peel us off, that's great. But then we're integrated from the beginning with the incident response people in evidence collection and working with all the different entities involved. Um, we've had instances where we've been on the ground with uh, Department of Homeland Security, us, uh, private incident response companies, additionally working with the IT teams in the business themselves because they are going to be absolutely critical to the evidence collection that we deal with. And in the upfront, you know, we can provide indicators of compromise that maybe you're not going to be able to get from somewhere else because there's a case being worked in the bureau where we can provide the latest and greatest on that and we've done that in ransomware cases and other uh, cases before um, and in terms of the importance of doing it and this team approach it's so critical when you integrate us to make sure um, you know in integrating us i should say it, we then can collect other indicators of compromise specific to your organization that then can be immediately pushed out as intelligence without attributing it to you at all um, that can be shared with other organizations and to help them. Additionally, if an indicator leads to a C2 node or a command and control node, you know, that's an opportunity for us to get up on the attacker's infrastructure and potentially notify victims before they've even been um, fully exploited. So that was, that's a huge benefit and um, it's been done before in the field. And that's always the phone call I like to make. Yeah, I, I think if you think about it like living next door to a police officer, right, you would definitely pitch that police officer hypotheticals on a daily basis. Like, hey, what if my son was smoking weed uh, kind of thing? Or, you know, in this case, what if there was a, a business email compromise at my organization? How would that play out? Or, you know, what if we were defrauded? Or what if we had a, it's an inner ransomware. And I want you guys to think of the FBI as like your, you know, your police department next door where you could pitch us hypotheticals. Uh, if you call us over for help, we're not investigating you, we're investigating the threat. We're not gonna pivot from investigating the threat to investigating you. And even, um, even if you feel that, you know, what you're providing us might not directly help you, you're always helping someone else, right? If you're providing us an IP address of an attacker, we can use that to warn everyone else in the neighborhood, you know, that this attacker is out there so that everyone else's firewall functions better or that everyone else's intrusion detection system functions better. A lot of times we'll be the ones to call you because we'll know ahead of time, you know, that this particular actor is in your network. Um, those are slightly awkward phone calls, um, but, you know, having that relationship with us ahead of time makes it a lot less awkward because then it's, you know, it's Samantha or Roderick calling you and not, uh, not some stranger from the FBI. And you have to wonder what this is all about. Uh, well, I can speak firsthand again, having made that call number one and, and secondarily my cyber command team working very closely with the Albany office. You were our police officer next door. And I know we bounce things off of you probably more often than you may have liked. And thank you for that. Um, and it was so very important in terms of your point on intelligence sharing, getting those indicators of compromise out there and also kind of understanding and overcoming the, um, you know, uh, the agency's resistance, perhaps. Samantha, I think you alluded to that in your comments. So let's take a moment to gather some additional feedback from our audience with another polling question. What are your organization's top operational challenges and concerns with regard to cyber and privacy? You can choose more than one choice on this one. Multiple selections are allowed. Is it working from home, which everybody is doing, but uh, some people are bringing folks back into the office. 
uh, data privacy, cyber talents and skill gap, uh, compliance, data breaches, securing online services and transactions, network security, user awareness, the third party supply chain risk factor or future cyber threats that are on the landscape. I'll give you a couple of minutes to give us some feedback and I will queue up the next question. So from the FBI's point of view, um, what I'm gonna ask is about uh, notable trends and challenges that you're currently seeing in cybersecurity and privacy. So while we let that poll run and we'll come right back to it, um, let me go ahead and pose that. Philip, from your point of view and the FBI's point of view, what are the challenges and trends that you're currently seeing in cybersecurity and privacy out there? Or put another way, what are the primary drivers behind this growing importance of cyber and privacy and, and what are organizations struggling with? Well, I think some of the things that, that we talk about that we see as trends for the future, um, we see um, certainly, I, I, think, uh, I think an increased occurrence of ransomware. Uh, when you think back maybe 10 years ago, uh, we were talking about cybersecurity in a different way. Ransomware seems to be uh, definitely something that's on the rise um, from my perspective. I think we see uh, different types of attacks. We see supply chain attacks. We see sometimes uh, the bad actors, uh, multiple bad actors sharing infrastructure, which uh, gives us some additional challenges when we're doing our role, when we're, uh, when we're looking for attribution and trying to hold somebody accountable. Uh, we also see sometimes harvesting of PII during an attack that will appear to not have any purpose, but it's gonna be used and it's gonna be exploited in the future uh, by the bad actor. Um, we also see uh, one of the things we just talked about yesterday is uh, weaponization of your personal data. And uh, it's kind of a trend that a ransomware actor will not just uh, they won't just be threatening you with the encryption and your, lock, your lack of access to your system, but they'll also be harvesting your data and they'll threaten to publish that data, uh, which kind of hits an organization uh, kind of in a different way than maybe they used to uh, because it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a damaging thing for an organization to have its data released uh, on some website uh, uh, certainly something that people are wanting to try and avoid. We're seeing a lot more, I think, insurance companies, a lot more uh, uh, utilization of cyber insurance, uh, ransomware insurance. Uh, we're seeing also, I think you guys might uh, weigh in on, are, are we seeing a kind of a trend with paying of the ransom? Is that something that we're seeing more frequently now? Or what would you say, Sam? I think actually the ransoms were paid a lot in the past um, mm -hmm. and not reported at all. And I think backups have become better utilized. And so more organizations are able to restore from backup and are less likely to pay ransoms as a result. Um, unless, as you said, the data is weaponized, in which case um, they may be paying to keep that information offline or off the dark net. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, I, I can um, really tell by what's reported. Yeah, I, there's there's no way to to know exactly how many people are paying ransom. A lot of times when people pay ransom, they don't tell us. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think a lot of what you're seeing in terms of the the higher rate of ransom paid in terms of uh, quantity per ransom is that actors are getting more successful at encrypting backups, um, and that's a stage they didn't have to get to before because people weren't making backups, right? So I think you're probably seeing a lot less uh, smaller victims but you know, uh, the attackers have to pivot to bigger victims. Um, in terms of what we're seeing actively, there's a lot of cobalt strike. So for the lawyers in the room, this is gonna be uh, uh, an attack platform that relies on PowerShell, which is installed on all your Windows computers. So it allows attackers to do things like remote access your network or remotely execute code using uh, software that's already installed in your network. So they're not necessarily using a virus that you would get alerted to. Um, so this is, striking a lot of people by surprise because they don't have PowerShell logging enabled already in their environment. Or um, if they do, you know, they're not necessarily auditing that. So uh, it's 
probably the, the, the most popular attacker tool we've seen in the last 18 months. I think we talked about examples of uh, supply chain attack. An example was uh, the recent solar winds attack is uh, a good example of that. And then uh, Roderick, we were just talking yesterday about uh, a good example of harvesting PII for future exploitation. And one of uh, one example of that, I think, was uh, Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. uh, and one we talked about was uh, taking the data from Experian and a lot of that data being used for unemployment insurance fraud because you have everything that you need to make an unemployment claim uh, just based off of what was seized in that uh, in that cyber attack. Um, that I think that a lot of our ideas that we've talked about so far, the trends that we've mentioned are focused on cybersecurity, but on the privacy standpoint, we've also looked at just the growth of encryption. And that's been a big topic for the FBI in the past uh, you know, five, 10 years is the growth of encryption tools and uh, communication platforms and our sometimes our inability to uh, be able to uh, use law enforcement tools and legal tools to be able to see what's going on there. Um, the growth of highly organized and effective criminal groups, and then also virtual currency with the advent of virtual currency and the popularity of that, that has created uh, kind of a whole new breed of money laundering that, uh, that allows people to make money with what they're doing. So, and uh, hide it from law enforcement. So those are some of our trends that we've talked about. Anything else that you would add? Uh, only that, you know, balancing privacy versus our ability to see things, you know, all the things that help us stay private, the encryption, uh, the use of virtual private services, those are the things that keep us individually safe. Um, it also makes it harder for law enforcement to do their job and to find the actor on the other side. So we're constantly having to um, reimagine and find ways to collect information um, in order to be able to attribute uh, attacks to the actors themselves. So never attribution never is hard for sure attribution has always been hard uh, although i think people think it should be easy right to just chase down the bad actor and and point the finger but it is a difficult uh, exercise to be sure so let's go to our polling results real quick um, they seem to indicate the data privacy and breaches network security and the risk impact of remote work are your topmost concerns which isn't surprising some of the things that our guests already mentioned and there also seems to be a fair amount of concern regarding the gap in cybersecurity skills and user awareness as well as compliance. Again, not surprising. Most organizations are battling and struggling with resource constraints and the overbearing um, compliance requirements that sometimes can um, complicate matters. So let's move on to question number four. Um, Let's see, preparing for a cyber incident is simultaneously probably the, the simplest thing to think about and the hardest thing that an organization can do to be ready. Based on your experiences, how well prepared are most organizations in terms of facing the types of threats and attacks that are coming up at us today? Do they generally have a viable cyber incident response plan at the ready? what key elements should they be thinking about and what steps and resources have you used in terms of recommendations for organizations and security teams to become better prepared? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I think some of the simplest things is starting that outreach early involving, you know, parting become, excuse me, becoming part of the groups that talk about these things on a regular basis, becoming part of InfraGuard, uh, joining the MSI SAC, uh, doing continuous education and reaching out to law enforcement to see how we can integrate and function together. Um, the preparation, um, you know, it, it's the ever evolving thing. So this isn't something that you craft once and are done. This is something that needs to be re revisited on a regular basis. Um, it tweaked and amped and tested, as Roderick alluded to earlier, you have to actually implement and test um, that incident response plan to know how well it's actually going to work. And we've seen that a lot with ransomware in terms of sometimes companies have backups, but they haven't practiced restoring from those backups. So then when the time comes, they think they have the answer um, and then unfortunately don't. Um, so 
that practicing, that preparing, that having your points of contact ready to go, the decision makers, how you're going to have that um, out of band contact with the organization in case your, your communication is on the inside or compromised, knowing which decision makers are going to make what decisions, like who says it's an incident, um, who gets notified immediately after that, when does their uh, internal counsel get notified, when is law enforcement brought in, um, at what point are you triggering cyber insurance um, and then a third party remediation company, um, and it kind of goes in a step from that. I think most of you probably work at organizations where you practice an active shooter drill or you have fire drills in the past year and maybe even one of those fire drills blocks off the staircase. But how many of you work at organizations where someone's sending out a test email to see, you know, who's going to fall for the phishing? Or how many of you are doing fire drills that might test the IT department to see how does the IT department respond when, you know, someone is effectively compromised? How does the IT department audit their logs and see, you know, would they detect an attack in their environment? Um, pen testing is not uh, necessarily a cheap thing to do. It's ex much more expensive than a fire drill, but it's something that organizations sh should consider either doing uh, internally or hiring a third party to help them with that. That's so, something that we do a lot in the FBI with all of the, th all, all of the programs and the threats that we face. We do a lot of coordinating with our local state and local partners, uh, sometimes with private industry to do basically war gaming, uh, going through our incident response plan, just making sure that uh, if nothing else, uh, we're actually getting all the people that would be a part of a incident response, we're getting them all together and we're having to talk through issues, we're having to coordinate those issues and work through the problem piece by piece. Uh, even if it's just at a table virtually, it's still helpful. Um, and one of the things that we've talked about a lot uh, just internally and you know, pre preparing for today's panel is to talk about uh, making whatever decisions you can beforehand. Know what kind of information you're willing to provide to the FBI. If you have an issue with providing some information with, to the FBI, talk about that beforehand and how you're going to engage with law enforcement. Uh, what in, Maybe uh, if you're an educational institution, you have uh, some privacy concerns that are different than if you're a healthcare institution. If you're a private industry, you're maybe a little bit more free to uh, just make that decision for yourself and, uh, and, and work with us a little bit more informally. Sometimes people have to, we have, they, they tell us we have to use legal process to get that information from them. They can't waive the right to the privacy to that information. So that presents some challenges, but work through those issues beforehand and actually make some decisions knowing that you're going to get asked that question. And one that we see frequently uh, that we're unprepared for is uh, how are we going to respond to the media? You absolutely need to have an internal communication plan and you have to have an external communication plan. When the media comes calling, what are you going to tell them? Mm -hmm. It, it, we sometimes we'll get into kind of a ping pong between the between uh, uh, the victim of a cyber attack and the FBI. We're not going to talk about victim information. We're not going to share with the media what's going on with you if you're in the middle of an attack, uh, and we're we're working with you on a response. You've probably seen this where somebody will. So where uh, the media will report on something and they'll say, uh, we contacted the FBI and the FBI said that they are assisting, but can't provide any more information regarding that assistance. Then they'll go back to the victim company and the victim company will say um, that, that they're not prepared to say anything about it. If you want to know more, you have to talk to the FBI. The FBI is in charge of the investigation. So they get ping ponged back and forth. Um, at some point, your, your staff, people are going to find out, they're going to have uh, information is going to get out there about what's going on. And uh, so having a plan for what information you're going to share, you're going to talk about whether it's ransomware or is it just a cyber incident? Are you going to, like, how are you going to communicate with people? If your email system's compromised, how are you even going to communicate with your, uh, with your clients or with your internal employees? what's going on, having all of that worked out beforehand, uh, you know, getting with your internal counsel, um, which, you know, we can talk about that some more, but 
uh, working with uh, your, your in-house counsel on, on getting an answer to those decisions before the incident occurs. Really excellent points. What particularly resonated with me was the incident response plan, fully tested for a, via tabletop exercises, drills, finding the flaws, the internal communication strategies for crisis communication, having some talking points rolled up and ready, uh, roles and responsibilities, even up-to-date contact lists, right? Minutes matter in response. And also I think Roderick, the point you made about proactively conducting phishing exercises to kind of harden or create that user awareness that you want in your, in your employees. So moving on to what you mentioned, which was internal counsel, um, a question from that perspective, what is the role of internal counsel from your perspective when organizations are one in the planning phase and two in the response to the incidents? Well, I think piggybacking on just what we just talked about, um, I think the internal counsel plays a very important role in uh, trying to trying to arrive at a decision, uh, a framework for what you're going to do with regard to engaging with law enforcement. At what point is your organization going to reach out to the FBI? What does it mean? how bad does it have to be or what you know, what does the scope need to be or what does the situation need to be work through those scenarios are you going to do that for a ddos attack or are you going to contact us for a ransomware attack uh, is your you know do you have a third party vendor for remediation um, that uh, that you you're already talking to uh, is that company, uh, is that going to be covered by your insurance? Making sure that you work through some of those issues. Uh, try to get decisions beforehand on those. You don't want to be gathering information and just trying to figure out what you're going to do in the middle of the crisis. Um, and and I, I think you can provide a lot of leadership and having some of those answers beforehand will really help your organization move smoothly during a crisis. And yeah. when we're on the ground, um, you know, that's our primary liaison point of contact um, besides the network folks. But the a lot of times, typically, when we're working, uh, an insurance company has been called in and the policy is being executed. The insurance company hires the council. The insurance company hires the third party remediation company. And so our sole conduit into um, that organization sometimes is uh, that counsel is that uh, insurance um, company's uh, lawyer. And that can be an extremely beneficial relationship. There have been times where we've been provided indicators of compromise that allow us to, like I said earlier, get up on infrastructure uh, and be able to warn other people um, or add them into um, indicators that are then pushed out in a flash message through, you know, InfraGuard or the MSI SAC. Mm -hmm. um, so, that is very beneficial. If it's the internal counsel to an organization specifically, um, then typically we're speaking with them and the IT people um, on a regular basis back and forth. So we'll be doing a lot of the information collection um, with them, but in terms of coordinating for that external message that um, ASAC brought up earlier, that's going to be through the council and any decisions about um, where we kind of go from there. You know, is the investigation going to continue? Will this actually be prosecuted at the end of the day? Or is this going to be where we collect all that intelligence and push it out, but don't necessarily take it to court um, for the benefit of the company? So I think people always see council, you know, your role is to protect the company and the company's reputation. And uh, a lot of times that means, you know, don't give away anything because anything might be used against us. Um, the, the FBI, with a little bit of information from you, can give you a lot of information back that can help you uh, feel empowered to make, you know, better decisions. Um, if you are willing to give us, you know, some IP addresses of the attacker, we can then tell you, okay, well, this particular attacker is a really serious threat or this one is a criminal threat mm -hmm. who's going to be maybe after you for money, where maybe uh, a nation state attacker might be after you to steal intellectual property that could be long-term, much more damaging for your business. And, you know, probably not as easy to clean up as, you know, your, your first instinct might be, right? It's not gonna be something where you can just re-baseline all your machines and move on. Um, so I think uh, as counsel, as a liaison, you know, it's, it's important for you to remember that, you know, 
having a good relationship with FBI and being willing to share that information is part of your, your duty as a protector of your organization. Um, saying, saying no doesn't necessarily give you all the tools that you need to succeed. Great points. So at this point, shifting a little bit to the left of the incident, right? What proactive advice can you offer for those who play a role in securing networks? What are some of the notable practices and actions that leading organizations are taking to strengthen their security and resiliency? So um, this is probably a little bit uh, geared toward your IT departments, but your IT departments should probably be aware of things like the 20 critical security controls from Center and Air for Security. Um, MITRE has both the sword and shield framework. So these are gonna be uh, active defense and threat hunting um, things that you should be doing. You should also be, as uh, ASAC Hale mentioned earlier, be thinking about things that you can pre-approve for sharing, right? So when you're in the middle of an incident, you're gonna have a lot of questions to answer and being able to look at your list and say, all right, I already know that sharing logs doesn't contain any customer data. I'm okay with uh, having an IT guy give the FBI whatever logs they need. Or, you know, these particular systems are HIPAA protected. We want a default no to these unless we have a, a serious reason to think that they're compromised. Being able to categorize your environment like that will require some inventory on your IT staff's behalf, but it'll save you a lot of time when stuff's on fire. Um, we mentioned uh, designating roles and responsibilities earlier. And if you are putting everything on one IT guy, because maybe you have a, a small office, you know, then he's probably not going to be able to both produce uh, for counsel, produce for the insurance company, produce for the FBI, and put water on the fire. Um, so understanding, you know, how big should an incident be before we request outside help, I think is, uh, is important in, in terms of understanding your limits. But also, if you have multiple people in your IT department, you know, designating one person for production collection, one person to lead a response, one person to help, uh, you know, be the in-between for you as the as the counsel who might not understand the technical details um, so that you have a person that you can constantly bug without feeling like you're impeding your own internal investigation. I think those are all really important. And another uh, point that we've seen with organizations is having leadership buy-in, you know, bringing leadership into cybersecurity as part of your solution, having them briefed up, making security part of the culture of the organization. Um, because once uh, the IT department can get that buy-in from management, they're going to have more resources at their disposal and maximize their ability to be effective. Um, and then, you know, going back to that, it's, you know, everybody is a player in this game. Every single person in an organization is part of their cybersecurity uh, team. And every user down to the level that Roderick was speaking about with, um, you know, not wanting to be that person who clicks on the link having that led um, by your leadership team and highlighted as important to the culture of the organization can really be beneficial to the posture um, going into incidents. I think as counsel, your uh, executive management, if you're not already part of your executive management, will really value what you have to say. Um, so using that power to help empower the people who are putting out the fire, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, blame the IT department for not properly securing the network, whether or not they were properly outfitted with the tools and uh, services that they needed to do that, or blaming the person for clicking the link, or associating the event that you have with a previous event that you think maybe is connected, right? Maybe there was a malware on Karen's computer three months ago, and you think, well, that, that must have been what's causing this problem today. Um, you know, you want those IT people to feel secure in their job so that they operate at 110% effectiveness during an intrusion and not feel like they're going to get fired, in which case they throw up their hands and walk away. You want Karen to feel like she's comfortable giving you all the information about that incident from three months ago and that she's not going to lose her job over it because otherwise she might, you know, say, oh, I deleted that email. I don't have it anymore. Um, and you want executive management to feel like, you know, that they can really trust their people to do a good job and not that they need to immediately resort to a third party if a third party isn't necessary. All such great points. Let's pivot on that and look into the future for a moment. What are the cyber and privacy trends for the future that organizations need to be proactively thinking about, kind of getting a head start on addressing, if you will? I think the the threats to come um, are the increasingly unique ways that the cyber criminals are going to be coming after us. 
Um, and how do you protect against something that you uh, don't know is a threat yet? I mean, we've seen that significantly this year. We've seen supply chain attacks before, um, earlier in 2018, when we started looking at firmware vulnerabilities that would uh, give attackers the capability to get into any system anywhere and be completely invisible to the operating system. That kind of kicked it off. Um, and now we have the solar winds uh, attack where they were able to get into a supplier of an inordinately large amount of organizations um, to be able to go after them. So I think um, kind of looking into the future, what kind of alerts, uh, what kind of integrated defense in depth do you need to build um, to be in the best place to catch the attack um, somewhere in the kill chain um, and protect the privacy of the individuals uh, information that you collect, right? So if you're a university, that's all your student and faculty data. And so many attackers are now using that again to leverage against the organization. I think the really obvious one from uh, 2020 is probably both the cloud and the work from home shift. Um, you know, your network infrastructure probably looks a lot different this year than it did two years ago. Um, so, you know, how are you prepared to defend that? Um, and then there's things like layered stakeholders, right? So, you know, if Microsoft gets hacked, which we just had uh, some serious exchange vulnerabilities, you know, how does that affect you? Um, you know, if Salesforce gets hacked or a point of sale gets hacked, how many victims are there down the line, right? A lot of, a lot of people uh, work at companies that provide services to other companies that provide services. And if one service goes down, there's a lot of other services uh, that will be affected by that kind of cascade. So think about how you might be affected by a failure at another company when planning for your own incident response. From a third party perspective, Phil? Yeah, I think some of the things that, uh, some of the things that people need to be thinking about is uh, what we've already mentioned, you need to be thinking about how you're gonna address uh, externally uh, media questions, how you're gonna interact with them, what things you're willing to share that's just becoming a much more prevalent piece of it. Uh, none, of, none of this, nothing happens like this without, uh, it, it seems like we're, we're working in the media area. We, we collaborate a lot. We have a public affairs specialist here at the FBI that oftentimes if we're working with somebody, they will engage with their public information officer and talk and uh, strategize a way to uh, communicate with people in the media and the public. Um, and at the same time, preserve our ability to be able to do what we need to do. And not also at the same time, if you're in a ransomware attack, be providing information that's valuable to your attacker. Uh, thinking about all those things at the same time. Uh, so having a strategy for that, uh, we've talked about the internal comms, making sure that you, you have, you think about how are you gonna communicate with people if you no longer have access to your internal email network and that's compromised. Um, one of the things that, um, well, I, you know, I think, uh, I think the, the privacy issues, uh, we've talked about some of the extortion using, uh, PII and, and, uh, you know, thinking about how you're going to handle that. Those are all, uh, significant things for people to be thinking about. And biometrics as well. We talked about that the other day, but the rise of you know, biometric authentication to devices um, and using that in your security. What information are you giving away? I remember uh, the school system used to require the uh, index finger prints of my kids in order for them to pay for lunch. That's how they pay. That was the only way to do it. Um, they wouldn't accept cash. So um, I was trying to dig to the bottom of that. Okay, how does this company store um, their uh, thumbprint or their fingerprint, um, do they salt that, right? So they're, if they're gonna hash it, do they salt that hash to make it um, much harder to reverse? Um, and so- You might have to explain. She had to explain to me what salting the hash meant, so. <laughs> it's adding random variables <laughs> into um, the math so that um, you're making it much harder to, to break. Because if you just um, have a straight hash of a, a password, um, sometimes there's ways to, um, you know, you can see, oh, this hash of this password using um, 
you know, this hashing algorithm always equals this value. So you can immediately see what the password is that way. And that's how you use, um, you know, different tables to crack those passwords. Uh, but if it's a salted hash, it's going to be nearly impossible. Now, ask me if I could get the answer from the company. And the answer was no. Um, we're never allowed to use our official position to gain information like that. Um, that was certainly no exception for me. Um, so, you know, I was just trying to talk them through to get to an engineer um, to, you know, ask them the questions for the privacy. And uh, there was no way, absolutely no way I was getting there. Um, you know, it could also result in healthcare information being breached, right? So uh, if you're looking at retinal scans and stuff like that, uh, when women are pregnant, um, that changes um, and they may no longer authenticate to what their original scan um, was um, because of uh, the changes in the blood vessels. So um, there's all kinds of um, issues with privacy when that comes into play. I would agree uh, with you. Some very uh, significant privacy concerns. Philip? No, I think also for the lawyers out there, one of the things that frustrates me is that it feels to me like our uh, our law on the, the way that we do jurisdiction and venue doesn't seem to have uh, evolved as quickly as cyber attacks have and, and the whole cybersecurity field. Uh, it seems a little ridiculous to me that in 2021, we're still having to scour through IP addresses and trying to find one that touches upon a, a particular jurisdiction. When we had uh, we had a, a significant victim in our AOR in our in our local area, um, you know it, it's more difficult in these cyber cases to uh, well oftentimes they're not uh, if if you look at what their address is their physical address where they're doing this activity from um, it's not in the United States that complicates things and then second where did the actual cyber attack happen I mean things are in the cloud. Uh, we're using uh, an assortment of, uh, you know, of, of web services with VPNs and different, uh, you know, different IP addresses, and it's very difficult sometimes for us to establish uh, a clear venue. And then when we go and we 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 go through the prosecution phase, uh, everybody has a different opinion about kind of what they want to see before they will attach venue in a certain uh, location. So those issues are. Sometimes frustrating. Uh, I, I think that we could use a little bit of an overhaul in how we look at that. On the technology side, I would say um, if you're securing customer data and you're told by your IT department that that data is, you know, encrypted or protected in some other way, as Sam mentioned, uh, a lot of times that data will be hashed. You know, is that data encrypted at rest? If so, is it ever actually at rest? Right. A lot of times, companies will need access to a data or a database in order to have tools function properly or to have people be able to do their work. And if that database is always opened, then you know that puts all that data at risk of being stolen by the adversary while it's in an unencrypted state. So maybe you're protecting the data at night, but not between nine and five. Um, other things to think about are how the Section 230 law is uh, affecting current extortion, right? So if I leave your business a negative Yelp review, there's nothing you can really do other than call Yelp and beg them to take it down. If I stand up my own website and someone happens to comment on my website that your business is terrible or that you in particular are terrible, I'm protected under Section 230. You can't sue me. The best you can do is ask me nicely to take it down. And maybe I have a, another company reach out to you and say, you know, for maybe $10,000, I'll, I'll take down that post. Um, so I think we'll see some cyber law get revised over the next five years in regards to how Section 230 works with extortion. Um, but those are issues that I'd be thinking about too. Roderick, on that question, I'd like to move to some audience questions and answers. We're having some uh, really good question interaction with our audience. And one particular question rose to the top in my mind. Uh, the individual states that they serve in an IR role as a negotiator on behalf of the victim for several ransomware attacks. And in the last year, they've seen secondary extortion related to exfiltrated data. And the point that they're making is that they don't see or have any faith in the assurances offered by the threat actor that they would not use the stolen data. In other words, once the data is restored, that they wouldn't maintain a copy and expose it or use it in some way. So despite his observations or her observations of, of this not being a value add to the deal, they're seeing it become more frequent as a, an aspect of concern. What are your views on that? 
think that's a great indication of when you should reach out to the FBI. The FBI actually keeps track of how the adversary uses the data, whether or not they're uh, still dumping stuff after the victim pays. So being able to get more intelligence like that uh, when you're making that negotiation could be beneficial to you. If the uh, thief is good to their word, you know, thieves have reputational values too. Um, and maybe that can help you make that decision process. So it, again, it comes back to that intelligence. Yeah, if I can uh, just add a little quick uh, blurb on that. I think one of the things that I, I definitely would like people to take away from the panel today is, is we view our interaction in the private sector uh, during a crisis, we view that as a partnership. It's, we're, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to take over and do things on our own without the assistance and the, the cooperation of a victim company. So uh, there isn't really a risk if you call us and you call us early and bring us in, if you decide to go a different direction or if you kind of define the parameters of how you're gonna work with law enforcement and that's pretty restrictive, we're still gonna be able to interact with you and give you some advice. We might be able to look for similar, uh, some indicators of compromise that can help you with remediation of your network. There are things that we can do to partner with you and try and help you out that are a lot less than the FBI coming in and taking over and parking a big bus out in your parking lot and, uh, and, and um, having a significant impact on the function of your business or your reputation. There are a lot of ways that we can work together and that's really a, a negotiation and a conversation and we're a partner. Uh, so I always advocate, bring us in, call us, talk to us about what's going on early as early as you can. I don't think we've ever been called too early. Is that, can you think of any time we've been called too early? Yep. Oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that goes back to framing an incident so, and making sure that you actually have an incident yeah. before you call it. But yep. That's okay, we're happy to help with that. <laughs> happy yeah. to give some guidance in that respect. Let's take another, um, it, this is a, an interesting question too. Considering the future landscape that you described and your views, what should practitioners be doing now to upskill themselves in preparation for those trends and, and the coming challenges? I think the learning curve um, you know, gets steeper the more technical you get. So being really familiar with the language of tech, especially for attorneys, is going to be absolutely critical. I and mean, we're seeing that more and more in courtrooms um, and how we deal with cases. Um, and you know, making sure you're always asking those hard questions. So we talked about earlier how everybody's uh, networks have greatly expanded, especially during COVID, where we're dealing with a lot of bring your own devices and um, dealing with vendors and other partners um, that uh, we might have connected with in a different way. Um, what are their security? How does that change your posture? Um, and asking what protections do you have in place? Is there the more secure um, way to configure this application on my network? Um, because um, sadly, most of the time, uh, the kind of applications you use, like in ed tech, uh, not the company, I mean, education technology, as in all the applications that support um, educational uh, needs, uh, don't come configured in the most secure format. Um, and, you know, so you're expected to figure out what that is. And so it's going to be asking those questions and doing a lot of research to get to where you need to be. I used the uh, fire drill analogy earlier. The problem with that analogy is that fires are a relatively static threat, right? You know that you know, there's a few hot spots in your office where that could probably start. And once it starts anywhere, it's going to have, you know, um, a pretty predictable path where the cyber threat's dynamic, right? So you're constantly going to have new types of attacks develop each year. New exploits are discovered every week. Um, so the only really good way to stay ahead of that is continuing education. So you can be part of an organization like FBI InfraGuard. You can subscribe to things like your uh, multi-state information sharing and analysis center will produce bulletins. The FBI pushes bulletins. Uh, New York State has uh, its own cybersecurity teams that push out bulletins if you're, um, if you're part of that community. You also have things like Albany Law who you know, might offer continuing education courses. There's professional organizations like uh, GIAC, um, who runs CISSP, C2? Um, IC Squared. IC Squared, that's right. IC Squared, yeah. No, I, I'll just add, 
add to the basically the same thing that uh, throughout the organization, especially the decision makers, executive level, they have to have at least some level of cybersecurity awareness because they're the folks that need they're the folks that are doing some of the yeah, they're approving the hiring. They're uh, they're looking at the third party vendor company that's going to come in and help out. You have to make sure that the people that you're hiring know what they're talking about. You have to have some level of uh, expertise. And so, you know, the, the, the people who are on this call, I'm sure, are the people who are trying to raise that level. Getting a master's in cybersecurity at Albany Law wouldn't be a bad idea. A little shameless plug. Um, but uh, just educating your organization at a baseline, especially in your leadership, they have to understand what they're talking about to make informed decisions. Thank you for those uh, recommendations. I would agree with all of them. And as we near the end of our time, a one minute lightning round, if you will, I'd like to ask each of you to just give me one or two points, key thoughts and takeaways for our audience. If they remember nothing else, go. Uh, war game, your incident response plan. Draw, draw it out, uh, practice it, uh, play it out, uh, inject scenarios that would make it more difficult, uh, make decisions early on, uh, as many as you can before the crisis occurs. Build relationships, um, you know, make sure you have relationships in place to help you respond, to build the team effort, and to make sure that, you know, you have the latest uh, information. I've seen that a lot in healthcare. Uh, one gets hit, they share their experience with everyone else to kind of raise everybody's game. When the fire starts, be the champion for the people putting out the fire. Uh, don't help make their, you know, don't make their life harder. Fantastic points. I want to be respectful of our time commitment and also our guests. So we'll have to wrap it up here. But as a quick reminder, a link to the recording will be sent out to all registered attendees after the event. Please take a minute to complete the survey. The link will pop right up after you close out of Zoom. In closing, I'd like to thank our panelists, Philip Hale, Samantha Balserson, and Roderick Link for sharing their experiences and insights here with us today. I'd also like to thank Will Trevor and the online graduate programs team at Albany Law School particularly Tom Rosenberger and Nicole Casal, as well as Global Cybersecurity Solutions LLC for making it possible for us to have this important discussion today. And of course, thanks to our audience for spending time with us. We look forward to seeing you again soon at another Albany Law School event. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day.